Very good. All right. Well, uh, okay. How are you? I'm great. It's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. No, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. This should be fun. Yeah, I'm excited to show. To, I want like showing people my favorite wineries and uh, nice people <laughs> too. So uh, let's well, let's start by you tell people who you are, where you are, and then kind of your history, how you got where you are. Okay. So uh, my name is Bruce Murray. My wife Diana Lilla and I are owners at Boundary Breaks Vineyard in the Finger Lakes. We are on the east side of of Seneca Lake, and I'm gonna turn this around and give you a little bit of a different view here. Beautiful. Um, huh. So uh, what you're looking at is uh, Seneca Lake, which is the, really the largest and most centrally located of the Finger Lakes. Uh, as you can see, we're right on the edge of the lake, and um, that's actually a huge advantage for us because it can get kind of cold up here. And um, if you're close to the lake and if you're on the east side as we are, um, your temperatures are a little bit milder. Generally, during the growing season, we get even more sun. So oh. if, you had to pick a, if you had to pick a spot, um, you would want to be on this side of the lake, as close to the lake as possible. Cool. Uh, we, started, we started about 12 years ago. Um, let me say a little bit about the name Boundary Breaks. Um, I'm coming back uh, this way. If, if, if you look just to the north, I'm going to walk a little bit down into the woods here. But what you're going to see is a very deep gorge. It's not really oh, yeah. that easy to see. But there's about a 100-foot drop-off down there. You can maybe find some, some water at the bottom of that. That's really a, a, um, a glacial... A gorge that was created by runoff when the glaciers that formed the Finger Lakes um, melted back 15,000 years ago. So there's all kinds of these big, deep gorges around the, ah. around the lakes, and these are breaks in the landscape. Ah. So our name, our name, Boundary Breaks, comes from the fact that there was one of these deep gorges or breaks at the northern boundary of our vineyard and then if you go all the way down it's about a quarter mile to the south is the other end of our vineyard there's another break like it at the other side so those are the boundary breaks very cool now are you going to ever expand beyond that area uh so we have so when we started in 2008 um we were uh new to this like okay. a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, there were no there were no vines here. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I were from this general area. I was in my early fifties, and I, I was living in New York City. And I thought, okay, it's time to make a pretty significant change. And I thought, all right, why not uh, go back to the region I was originally from, um, find a piece of land, and plant riesling. And why <laughs> riesling? Um, I had been to a great restaurant in Las Vegas um, in 2004, 2005, a place called Lotus of Siam. They had this great Riesling wine list, and I had a fantastic uh, uh, Dunhoff Spadelesa in uh, 2004. And I thought, you know, this combination of Thai food and Riesling is, is un indescribable. Why don't I go plant Riesling and, and try to try to do in the Finger Lakes what the Donahoe family does in um, in Germany? I love that story, and I was going to ask you to tell it too because it really struck me. Because I'm like you, a Spatle says nothing like it. So uh, yeah. I, I love that story. Um, so that was 2005, 2008. We found this property. Okay. 2009, we started planting vines. And, okay, you know, like a lot of people. You think you know what you're doing, <laughs> um, but we got a lot of good advice. And so today we are in uh, to the tune of about 40 acres. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. We've planted 40 acres in the last 10 years. Great. Um, most of that is Riesling. Um, we have begun to plant Cap Franc. Oh. And
and and we're hearing rumblings from people like yourself, Jeff, that wouldn't it be great if we could produce some great gamay from this oh, uh, region wow. of New York? Wow, that's awesome! That you see my eyes open. Wow, that would be very cool. Well, I know. And I, let me. You know, I was on. I was on a, a phone call with our distributors, one of our distributors, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the reps asked me, you know, what's new? What's coming? What's the new new thing coming out of the Finger Lakes? And you know, I would say, if you're on this side of the aisle, if you plant vines, you better know what you're doing in terms of a varietal. Yes. Yeah. You can't just chase every single sure. new thing that comes down the pike. And so we have to be a little careful. But so when we decide what to plant, we, need, we look around, we see what is working in this climate. And then we think about, all right, what, what does the market ultimately yeah. uh, look for? Right. And, and um, I would say we're, we're, we're pretty, I mean, this is a very risky thing to do. We're, we're generally pretty conservative, so we try to plant varieties that have a really strong European um, background, grapes that we think will make world-class wines in this climate, and certainly mm -hmm. Riesling is there, um, Cabernet Franc, certainly, and, and because people like red wine, we're going to probably start to experiment with Gamay. I, I want to hear more about that for sure, but can we just back up a second and would you explain in a little more detail why the lakes and the Finger Lakes is wine country and just give a kind of a rundown of that? Sure, sure. So Finger Lakes um, region in, in central New York, there are 11 lakes. Grapes have been grown here for about 150 years. Okay. I mean, it was, it, it's right along the Erie Canal. Um, and so back in the 1800s, when the United States was still pretty, pretty young, people liked to drink anything. And so it turned out you could grow grapes in this region. You could get them to transit routes like the Erie Canal. Oh. And this is a really prosperous wine growing region from about 18... 60 okay. through prohibition. In the 1970s, um, California really took off as really the premium winemaking region in, in the United States. And all the grapes that were grown in the Finger Lakes really were really not competitive with uh, California grapes. Okay. And so, so there was a long, deep tradition of, of grape growing and viticulture here. And what began then was transition away from native and hybrid grapes that may may be hardy, they may be de disease resistant, but they're really not competitive in the marketplace. So starting in about the 18, 1980s, um, grapes began getting planted here that were European varieties. Um, and so just about everything was planted. Okay. Um, and because the climate is a little, uh, a little colder than what you're used to in places like France and Spain and Italy and Portugal and California, a lot of trial and error took place. Okay. And, and through trial and error, basically Riesling emerged in the early 2000s as being a great variety that would ripen it, every year. It would produce good wine every year and, and it could be grown. So right now, um, the the largest plantings of of vinifera or European grape varieties in the Finger Lakes is is in Riesling. Mm -hmm. um, and is there something about the wood of a Riesling vine that it's more uh, impervious to the cold? You know, I don't, I don't actually, I don't think so. I okay. mean, we do a lot from a viticultural standpoint, Jeff, uh -huh. to make sure make sure these vines survive. You know. In a lot of parts of the world, the winemaker tends to be the celebrity. I think in this region, it's really the viticultural practice yeah. that dictates whether or not the wines at the end of the day are, are going to be as good as they, as they should be. Right. And, and a, a lot of it has to do with how you prepare your vineyard for cold weather before the winter uh, starts, and then how you trellis your vines, uh, how you expose them to sunlight, how you pull leaves. You know, we spend, we spend probably 
per acre, maybe more than anybody else wow. in simply vineyard practice because we sell a lot of our wines in, in, in the, in the third-party distribution market. We're in right. 27 states. We're outside the U.S. Oh, great. And if you're not making really, really good wine from really, really right, really clean grapes, yeah, we won't, we won't register when it comes to people like yourself. Yeah. So it comes, it, it comes to viticulture. Now, the Finger Lakes, because they're so deep, right, outside, right behind me, that lake is about 700 feet deep. And, and that means that in the wintertime, when it's maybe minus three or minus four, uh, uh, further away from the, the lake, we are maybe at plus five or plus six. And, and certain grape varieties will just not tolerate temperatures below, say, minus five or minus six. Okay. And that eight to 10 degree difference in, in um, uh, winter temperature, we're eight to 10 degrees warmer means that we can grow grape varieties here close to the lake that others can't. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, a real world manifestation of the word terroir. I mean, these are, these are microclimates because we're close to the lake. Yeah. And it's, people forget that terroir is not just the earth itself. It's in relation to the lakes and in relation to the geography and uh, things like that. A a absolutely. And, you know, I, before I was, deeply involved in this, I was a little skeptical of the whole concept. Right. Because I, I, I it seemed a little squishy to me. <laughs> but now, yeah. now that we happen to have a vineyard where it is, and how, now that we see what results we get, again, we're not, we're not magical. We just try to do the, everything we can, but we get results that are really much, much better than we expected, I think, just because of where we're located. That and so, what, are you? You're planting gamay yet, or about to? You're not. You're not planting yet. No, we haven't planted any gamay yet. We started. We we were going to make just riesling originally, okay. and so we we um, we called a nursery in California and said we'd like five thousand riesling vines, and and they said, okay, which clone of the riesling variety are you interested? Which rootstock and. We didn't know there were choices, so we sort of stepped back and said, okay, what do we want to do with respect to clones and rootstocks? And we said, look, we're doing this for the first time. Let's plant five different clones. Let's see if we, see, we, can, mm -hmm. we can experience any difference between those clones. Mm -hmm. Let's make wines specifically from individual clones. So we make a single clone, single vineyard wines. Um, I think we've learned in 10 years that there are differences uh, between okay. these clones. Sometimes um, we like to blend them. But uh, we got started with the idea that the world will beat a path to our door as long as we make really great Riesling. For sure. So then do the clones make a difference? Like I have the 239 and the 198 at the Waverly Inn. Uh, is that clonal selection or after you pick, you decide where it's going to go? So we, we decide, well, let me, um, let me back up a little okay. bit. So a lot of those, a lot of our ability to influence the quality and the, and the style of the wine comes from the timing of our harvest. Okay. And, and we've learned that we like to make a little bit bigger Rieslings, whether they're dry or, or less dry. Mm -hmm. And we learned back in 2014, which was our fourth vintage, when we had a very hot, dry fall season, that we could get our, our, our grapes really ripe and then ferment them dry. So, that, so if you were being technical about it, these would be um, trucking oh, sweet really? wines. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was in 14, we discovered a style of Riesling that that was really a product of, of, of really leaving the grapes out a little bit longer and letting them ripen a little bit further. So with our, um, so with our depending on the year now, we, we can adjust our harvest timing and then we can adjust the style of, of the wine in the cellar by deciding when to stop the fermentation. I see, the okay. The, the, both the 239 and the 198 we like to see as really rich wines, the 239 um, 
is more of a truckin style, the 198, more of a classic spray lace style. Okay. And just for, there are some winemakers on here. Um, when do you get bud break? I assume you're kind of right there now and, uh, or maybe already passed. Well, and let's when... take a look. Let's, let, let's take a look where awesome. we are right now. Thank you. Um, and then when uh, do you harvest so, also? So we, we, so let's just take a look here. So right now, okay. um, we're, we're looking at, uh, let me get you the, all right. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Uh, all right. So there is a bud and that wow. is not even close to breaking right okay here. i mean normally normally those buds would swell and then suddenly they get a little bit fuzziness you'll see a bit of green and then they'll break so it's okay. april 27th wow it is very late it is yeah break. yes um and and so again in some ways we don't mind that that it's late because the alter the alternative is an early bud break and and we can have frost as late right. as may 13th may 14th and you had so a for, you had a warm stretch too right a week ago we have not no, oh you haven't have oh, okay had, right? yeah this is very unusual we have not mm -hmm. had a warm stretch but we would much rather have it like this yeah. um than than um than having a warm spell where with the buds break we get young shoots and then suddenly you get a hard freeze. Yeah. And, you know, that's, a, that's another advantage of being close to the lake is you, your vines can survive, the, the young buds, the young shoots can survive 32 degrees, 33, but they don't like 26 or 25 degrees. Right, okay. And the six or eight degrees difference, you know, it seems like we're talking about, uh, we're splitting hairs here, but believe me, we're not splitting hairs. It yeah. really matters to be there. Yeah. So we, 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 we tend to see bud break early May and, and ideally no frost following that. And then again, it depends on, on the season. We, mm -hmm. um, we would like to keep our fruit out till the middle or latter part of October. Wow. Okay. And, and that way we can ensure that, that we're getting the, the physiological ripeness that, that we like. Right. I mean, a lot of our Rieslings, I would not say our Rieslings fall into the sort of steely austere category. We just we we aim for a little bit richer mm -hmm. and still dry style of wine. So, do you pick a little bit later than your neighbors up there? Yes, yes, we tend to pick later. The other thing, what what also dictates um, the uh, timing of harvest is disease pressure. So, our our fall seasons tend to be wet, and uh, moisture and dampness and humidity can cause molds and mildew. In okay. Vines. Um, before we planted, we put in what's called drainage tile, or basically underground drainage pipes beneath mm -hmm. the, these vines. So every row here, in effect, is a down four feet is a is a six inch pipe that collects water and carries it away. Mm -hmm. It keeps the vineyard drier, which means in the fall we're going to be able to keep our grapes out longer because our mold and mildew pressure is less. I and see. And this is, believe me, if you live in a climate like this, these things matter. Yeah. And if you're in, I mean, if you're in, if you're in California, if you're in places where the climate is much more hospitable, you might not have to worry about these things. The fact that we put the drainage tile in that we did leads to drier uh, vineyard leads to keeping us, um, keeping our fruit out longer allows us to get it riper and gives us more flavor in the wine. But usually when you hear about mildew, you think about it being in the bunches of grapes and you want wind and stuff. Are you talking about mildew down in the roots? Well, no, we're so, well, so you've got the, the two places that mildew and mold can, um, can harm you is on both of the, the, um, the clusters of grapes, but mm -hmm. also the foliage. So if, okay. you, if your leaves start getting mildewed, their photosynthetic ability begins to decline. Okay. And so it's that photosynthetic capacity that allows you to ripen your grapes. Right. So if you have a vineyard with all the foliage or all the leaves covered with a either powdery or downy mildew, your leaves aren't functional. Your grapes are underripe and, and your wines are, are, are inferior. 
So the, the, the goal is to keep both your clusters free of mold, but also your, your foliage. But so how does drainage four feet down help that? Question. So, if you look at the ground now, let me just show you. It's um, it's it's really wet. Yeah. Um, that's that's basically. I mean, the soil here is is not. You know, this is not. Um, this is not the rune. This is not um, uh, the duro in Portugal. Right. This is really heavier soil. It retains moisture, and that that moisture will emanate upwards. Oh, wow! So you 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 get a rain in in September. It soaks into the ground, and then it and it gets really hot. And suddenly, that you you've got you know think of a think of a a a wet <laughs> a wet basement that's really hot. Yeah. You're getting moisture emanating up through through your vineyard. Wow! And so having the having the vineyard stay as dry as we can limits the amount of moisture that's available to emanate upward like gotcha that. thank you for clearing that up that that makes a lot of sense when you spell it out for me i appreciate it it's it's, <laughs> it's way down in the weeds and it's probably the least <laughs> sexy thing that you can really discuss but for whatever reason it we attribute whatever ability to keep our fruit out as long as we do to that also you mentioned you mentioned um le uh clusters so I'm going to turn around here again and show you. You see these vines. Um, you, you see that there's there's um, two trunks, and then two what we call fruiting canes yep. coming off those trunks. Well, the, the the what what this kind of trellising system allows us to do is keep all our fruit as it's on its shoots in roughly a an 18 to 24 inch zone here. What we do is we remove leaves in that zone, what we call a fruiting zone, which opens up the canopy for two reasons. It opens up the canopy or, remove, or, or exposes those um, fruit clusters um, to wind and airflow, which mm -hmm. dries them out. And it also exposes them to, um, to sunlight. And that will dry them out. It will also ripen them. So the, the way you actually trellis your... your um, your vines, the way we've done it here, as you can see all the way down, um, ultimately is another way to ensure that you're getting maximum ripeness because A, you're, you're, the wind uh, is, is drying them out and you're able to leave them out longer and the sun is allowing them to, um, to ripen. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about I, I mean, farming practices and everything right now, I mean, you're socially distant, but how is the coronavirus? I, I, we're at f 25 minutes, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. But how has that happened? Like, I assume you do a lot of on-premise customers. And how are you reacting and managing with the coronavirus? So, um, yes, our vineyard's really busy. So we haven't really slowed down in the vineyard. We keep ourselves distant. Um, we have not been open for customers for about a month now. Okay. We have a wine club, and uh, the wine we have more than fifteen hundred members of uh, in our wine club, and they are uh, we're in the middle of a wine club shipment for this spring, so we've been vi we've been busy basically shipping wine out and and letting people kind of either stop by at the curb and pick up their wine, or telling us which wines they want and we ship it out to them. So okay, we're operating uh, we're operating a little bit like Amazon would right now, mm -hmm. um, and you know. A month from now, 45 days from now, it's going to be different because usually we yeah. see uh, the, the summer season pick up in, in mid to late June. Right. But so you do sell to retail around, you said, 27 states? We do, yes. So we're in, we've got a different distributor pretty much in every state. We're with Polaner in uh, New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're struggling just like the whole on sure. Trade is tr struggling, but we're, that's going to come back. We, we're, we're very hopeful. And do you sell just, it's the wine club and people can join from your website, which is in your profile, I assume? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And just before we go, can you walk us through the different wines just one more time? There's a few people new on here. Just walk us through the wines that are available. Sure. We make, um, we make six different uh, Rieslings, uh, a, a sparkling Riesling, a, a, a couple dry ones, a, some, one in the middle 
the Spade Lace of the 198 Reserve. We make an ice wine, which we grow. Uh, we leave on the vine and, and harvest when it's uh, 15 or degrees or so. We make a couple Gewurz Traminers. Oh. And we make a Cab Franc and then, and then a Bordeaux style blend, which is typically a little bit Cab Franc dominant. So wow, about great. 10 or 11 wines. The Rieslings are the, the core. Uh, we think Cab Franc is, 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 is in the next three to five years going to become a very important part of our, our offering as well. That's exciting. Well, I'll let you go. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I'm doing this to give my friends who are in, back in the city in their apartments some fresh air and uh, a little education for all the people doing virtual happy hours and wine tastings. So thanks for your time. Do you have anything to say before we go? So just thanks to thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. And when the when the weather gets better and the rules get looser, I guess you know it's not that far from the city. No, I'm coming Come up, up soon here. for sure, for sure. And and it's 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 worth the trip. I mean, it, it, you'd be surprised. We're we're uh, we're all kind of what you see is what you get. And yeah, and there's some great wine being made up here. It's one of my favorite places. So I'll definitely see you soon.